All right, welcome everybody. I'm glad uh, everybody is still hanging in there. I know it's Friday afternoon and it's, I think, almost beer o'clock. So we've got only 30 minutes and that's really a short amount of time for the things I want to say. So let's start talking about Drupal in a Mac world. My name is Albert Skibinski. You can find me anywhere on the web with the same handle and that's uh, askibinski. Uh, and I will post these uh, slides afterwards on uh, Twitter. Uh, and also uh, I have my assistant uh, unicorn moderator uh, brother, uh, Ben Skibinski in the chat, who will uh, collect all your questions. And hopefully we will have some time afterwards to answer, answer them. And if not, or uh, you want to ask me afterwards, uh, you can always reach out to me on Twitter. So, I'm a developer at uh, Intracto. We are a pretty large company nowadays in Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, I'm mostly doing Drupal development, um, but I also, uh, lately I'm also expanding more towards uh, architecture and decoupled uh, architecture, headless solutions, frameworks, uh, you know. And also I'm training junior devs in, my, in, in our Drupal teams. Um, and Intractor is one of the gold sponsors, so that's nice because it makes this a free event. So a little disclaimer up front, uh, as I told you, I'm mostly a developer and the DevOps world is not really my specialty. Uh, and this, this session is labeled DevOps, but it's mostly, a, it's a lot about architecture. Um, and it's mostly from my developer point of view. So what I discovered on my journey is that DevOps really like buzzwords and uh, yeah, a lot of them. So what I made for you, and you can follow along with a link, uh, which will also be in the chat, is a little buzzword bingo card. So you may have some little fun on the side. All right, Mach. So what's that? Well, it's an umbrella term, right? Well, I think mostly as, it's, it's kind of like the buzzword to, to rule all other buzzwords. Because it stands for microservices, API first, cloud native SaaS, and headless. So these are probably terms you are already heard of. And when we're talking about Mach, there's also uh, such a thing as the Mac Alliance. And they promote the Mach architecture. So they are a group, uh, they are an organization uh, and you can find the website uh, with a lot of members and vendors, and they are divided in uh, people who are building SaaS products uh, with a Mach architecture or uh, system integrators who can help you into transforming your company or organization uh, in a Mach architecture. So I'm using uh, this Mac Alliance because when I was researching this topic to, to get more information, uh, they really offer a, a nice set of guidelines and a lot of things, they say a lot of things about it. So, but if you yeah, visit the website, you will read things like, we present and advocate for an open and best breed enterprise technology ecosystem. Or uh, what we want to do is future-proof enterprise technology and propel current and future digital experience. And also enterprise suites are no longer the safer choice. The Mac ecosystem is, it's agile and nimble and always up to date. So yeah, lots of buzzwords there, right? But what does it all mean? Well, in my own words, when we talk about Mac, uh, we are talking about a standard for enterprise tech described by these four principles. In a way, so enterprise tech can uh, take advantage of the modern cloud solutions, which are, and I will get into that. Okay, but this is a Drupal gen session, right? So how does Drupal fit in? Do we need Drupal to fit in in any way? Is Drupal best of read, composable, and what is cloud native anyway? So I'm seeing this whole session like an exploration into this, into this Mac world and how Drupal fits in and how we could build something with Drupal which fits in. So let's explore. Could Drupal be used in a Mac architecture like, like in a Mac vendor platform like some of the other uh, uh, applications you can find on the Mac Alliance website? Well, 
if you go look at the website, you will actually find a button over there for vendors and an application form. So uh, let's click that. You will get an application form, which is not even that long, and you will see all these requirements. So for, for, for example, you will see that your application, uh, your platform has to be at least uh, three different microservices. Okay, but you also see requirements which are about your business model, uh, how many employees you have backing up this product you are uh, offering as a SaaS, and even how, many, how much revenue you, you have to make. So that's not, they, they ask, uh, they have a lot of requirements we, which go way beyond the, the technical scope. And I will be mostly focusing uh, on, on the application part, right? Because we're not very much interested in this whole other layer of requirements, which the Mac Alliance adds, but we can still just use the Mac architecture. So quadruple be used as an official Mac Alliance vendor platform? Nah, probably not. But let's see how far we can get with building a Drupal software as a service platform using these Mac principles, right? Okay. So how do we do that? Well, I thought let's make a scorecard and see how Drupal performs for each of these principles. So for example, if we have microservices uh, and, and, and Drupal scores 100% uh, in, in, in that area, it would get three, three stars. Simple, right? Okay. So microservices is the first one. So what is microservices? It's, we probably heard a little bit about it, uh, but it's about separating complex stuff into single services, which do one thing and do one thing very well. In that way, you can uh, manage them separately without dependencies, develop them and deploy them when they're ready, no more other dependencies. And there've been a lot of information uh, lately uh, in the past couple of years released how Drupal can be used in, uh, in the microservice architecture. Uh, so these are a couple of them from DrupalCon and DevDays. Uh, but mostly it's an architectural choice and we don't want to do everything with Drupal, right? We want to split it up into various independent services. And in my opinion, the hardest part is not the splitting up itself, but knowing when and where to make the switch. So when I was researching this, um, I also found this blog post, which is also on the Mac Alliance website. And it's, it also has a video made by uh, Sam Newman, which is an authority on, on microservices. And he made a book about uh, what microservices are and how you can use them and the benefits, downsides. But he also made a book about, and he explains this a bit in this video too, about how you can split up a, a large monolith into microservices. So this brings us to Drupal, right? Because is Drupal a monolith? Well, Drupal does do a lot of different things and it handles a lot of different tasks. So I think it's a monolith. And, but, the, but the benefit is it's a mo modular monolith. So especially from Drupal 8 and up, uh, we've got these modules and these modules are namespaced. So there is a kind of separation between a lot of the functionality which we have in Drupal. And a way to split this functionality into uh, separate services would be to just peel off separate uh, modules into or groups of modules into separate services. So you only end up with a very lean, mean, uh, Drupal core, which only does one thing. And in our case, that would be just the back end uh, as a content management system. So yes, I think we can use Drupal inside a uh, microservice architecture uh, and it would be, well, you can debate if it can be used as a service itself, because even if you strip it from all the, all the things you don't need into separate services and just for the stru structured content management, part, you, you can easily argue that Drupal core still does a lot of things. But okay, I think let's start positive, right? We're on a Drupal jam, so two stars. So next up is API first. And this is also very interesting because what, what they say is, what the Mac architecture say, says is 
that all functionality in your application should be exposed through an API. So uh, your whole application should, you should be able to control it through an API. Now you might say, yay, hey, we've got the API first initiative, right? So we're, we're good. Well, it also means you have to first model the API for optimal consumption and then model the microservices, microservice, the backend behind the API. So looking at Drupal, it's the other way around. So this is a blog, blog, blog post by uh, Dries uh, from a couple of years ago, and he states how Drupal continues to evolve towards an API first platform. And that's not very weird because uh, Drupal is 20 years old and 20 years ago, we didn't have any cloud or API first issues. But according to Mark, and the principles and the idea and the whole paradigm, this is the wrong approach and it leads to not exposing everything. And they, they have a point in, in this case, because if you look at the documentation, uh, you will find a page about uh, the JSON API, which is in core as part of the API first initiative. And it's great because it exposes a lot of content, but they're all entities. So there is still a lot of business logic left which is not uh, accessible through this JSON API, which can be controlled. And some of it is exposed, like uh, in the example on this page for the user login and registration, they are exposed in uh, different endpoints by uh, APIs by, the, by core. But we still have other issues, which are also core. For example, the layout builder, uh, which was added and it, it, it still isn't exposed. Or maybe an even better uh, example is paragraphs, right? I mean, every Drupal site I've seen, larger Drupal site lately in the last couple, in the last five years, uses paragraph to have structured complex content. Um, but if you have a node and you expose it to a JSON API, uh, you will have relationships to the relationships to these these uh, paragraph entities and links, but no. Uh, the, the you won't have the content of it in your response. So this is an example how if you would model the API first and optimal, you wouldn't have this problem. And now we're first making the, the backend for it and then uh, creating the APIs. So it's the other way around. And there even is a whole list of uh, missing APIs. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this whole list is complete, but it's a start. And it, Specifically for this issue, if you go into the comments, you will find a, a comment by Jeff, uh, which who makes a really good point because you really need this uh, complete API if you want to make cloud native apps, which I will get to next. Otherwise, it's very hard or impossible to deploy them in Docker and Kubernetes uh, environments. So I think API first is an important uh, requirement for cloud native applications. And you should be able to control, control the entire application by API. So yeah, one star. Next up is cloud native, cloud native software as a service. So software as a service, uh, but this is the requirement uh, from, from Mark, right? Software as a service that leverages the cloud beyond storage and hosting, including elastic scaling and automatically updating. Okay, this is where it gets interesting. So this whole cloud native thing is uh, a general approach. It's, it's also an whole paradigm, which is, goes way beyond just uh, the application part. But looking at the application part specifically, it means we are creating applications which take full advantage of the cloud computing model. And those are your cost. Uh, you can uh, you just pay for what you use. You have the easy vertical scaling if you need more memory or CPU or whatever. Uh, horizontal scaling if you need more instances and maybe with a load balancer in front of it. And you have very fast setup speed and high, availab high availability. And one of the companies who actually um, pioneered a lot of this stuff is Netflix. And they, they paved a lot of the way for us because um, they, they are a cloud native company. 
And a famous example uh, is maybe you've heard of it is the Chaos Monkey, one of their subsystems they, they once made, which just randomly uh, destroys containers in their, in their whole ecosystem, in their whole, in their whole system. And, to test the resilience, how fast the, the different containers and services go back up. So just because we're talking about cloud, I just wanted to quickly mention the three main types of cloud computing. So we're all on the same page. This is software as a service. We're all familiar with it, with Dropbox and Slack and um, yeah, Gmail, whatever. Then we have platform as a service, uh, things like Pantheon and uh, Platform SH and uh, Acquia. Uh, and we have infrastructure as a service, right? So Amazon Web Services, uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, or Google Cloud uh, services. And uh, this model really helps me uh, for uh, understanding this, this mental model to, to understand it better. So on the far left, we have this on-premise solutions where you keep everything in-house in the basement. And then you have the infrastructure as a service in the cloud where you manage everything from uh, the OS level and up. Then you have platform as a service where you typically manage the application and data. And the last is uh, software as a service where you don't manage anything, you just get a user inter interface and probably probably an API. So who remem remembers Drupal Gardens? There will be a poll in, in the chat, I believe. Well, Drupal Gardens was software as a service in, back in 2010, where you could easily create a Drupal website. But of course, at that time, it wasn't cloud native. But um, I think it evolved into something more cloud-based in Acquia. I'm not, I'm not really sure. But it was a nice example of a software as a service. So for our experiment, we would like to use Drupal as a fully cloud-native and, in this case, software as a service uh, platform. And we would automate, we would want to automate everything up to the point where you can just spin it up and uh, get a new Drupal space and just get API keys. So to understand that a little bit more, I made this very quick uh, recording of uh, Contentful, which is one of the other uh, competitors, not really, but it's a software as a service uh, content management system. And I will quickly show this. Let me just rewind it quickly. So I'm already logged in here and I'm creating a space. Um, of course, I'm choosing the free community edition and creating the Drupal Jam space here. With an example space and an example app. So when I hit this button, it starts to create. And this takes like 20 seconds, I think. So Contentful also uses uh, Kubernetes and I'm not sure what exactly they're doing, of course, but you can find some uh, details on their blog. But one of the things they do is uh, create an, uh, a separate container uh, with, your, uh, with your content repository. And uh, when it's ready, you have this new uh, content management system. Uh, you can start creating content, modeling content. And yeah, it's in a separate uh, namespace hash uh, and you get API keys. So that was what I, what I was talking about. And with these keys, you can control the whole application. And don't worry, I deleted the space afterwards. So if we would like to build something like this, we would typically build it in this space in the cloud. Okay. But cloud native uh, requires us to think a bit differently in specifically three areas. And for, for starters, our platform should be built using microservices. Uh, we already talked about microservices a little bit. So we need to containerize each service in a separate container and we, we will probably use something like Docker and Kubernetes for the orchestration. But then specifically about Drupal, we need to have some guidelines uh, how to make it into a really cloud native app. 
Well, luckily for us, there is something like the 12 factor app guidelines, and I will get to that next. So we have this kind of checklist uh, for Drupal. And lastly, we need some kind of automation. So uh, if these new spaces are created and configured, deployed, and monitoring is added and so forth, so different containers are set up, um, there's this automation layer we need. And that's why it's so important to have complete APIs on each application inside each microservice, because you need to have full control. So talking about Drupal, we have this 12-factor app, which is a methodology for building cloud-native application. Well, that's exactly what we need to know. So it's online, you can find it, a beautiful website. And um, it's a checklist of 12 items, and there are lots, you can find a lot of more details on the website. And I, we don't have time to go through them all, but just looking at the first one as an example, uh, for example, the code base, uh, it tells us a bit about how the code base should be organized and that you're supposed to use uh, some kind of versioning system, like Git flow with pull requests and an approval process. Uh, and also that you need to dockerize stuff and have automated tests. So this is probably something we're already doing or are trying to do or are supposed to do anyway, but it's not the hardest part, right? So one of the most challenging uh, parts is uh, how a 12-factor app must be stateless. And to quickly explain what a stateless app would be is, well, for example, if you would have a calculator, which is spun up in a, in a container, well, if you use a calculator, you don't, you don't care what it's what what kind of information you you entered like a week ago you just start with a fresh slate and start calculating and then you close it and you and it forgets everything right so that's stateless but most applica applications don't work that way especially not applications such as complex as drupal where everything is stored in a database and you need the database to be persistent you don't want uh, the database to be destroyed where uh, or the container to be destroyed where the database uh, as, as a service lives, and then you would lose all the data. So this is an, a challenge and there are uh, several solutions for this problem. So for example, you can have a managed uh, database from one of the cloud providers, or you can roll your own with uh, Kubernetes and things like persistent volume. The same thing applies for the file system. And here also we have solutions from, especially for, from the cloud services like an, uh, EFS, but you have to pay for them. Another challenge is uh, the backing service. So uh, the MySQL database is a backing service and we store all the configuration in, in Drupal in settings.php, but if we want to use it in a Kubernetes environment, we have to use environment variables. It's all doable, but it's all stuff we need to change. Another uh, challenge is the installation process. So typically Drupal is installed using the interface and there is no API to install Drupal. We lack the API, but in these cases, we can actually use Drush as a workaround, kind of like a sort of middleware to fill in the gaps where we are missing some APIs. Well, it's not ideal, but it's it's doable. So yeah, but it does feel like we're pushing Drupal a bit out of the comfort zone, right? So we can do all these things kinda, and maybe with a lot of patches probably, but yeah, it feels a bit like we're going on slippery ice. So also one star. And then we have headless and well, I think we, there have been so many sessions in the last years about headless. We don't have to talk very long about this. Uh, Drupal isn't headless by default, as we know, but it's relatively easy nowadays to decouple the front end and lots of people are already doing great things with it. And the whole framework ecosystem also matured into these uh, frameworks, which solve a lot of problems we had before. Uh, we have server-side rendering, uh, those kind of stuff. And there's there are really a lot of 
great resources for different strategies you can uh, adopt uh, to decouple Drupal. So I would say without going in too far into this, uh, yeah, it's okay, two stars. So you can say, okay, but the thing is, uh, these four principles aren't equally important because microservices and API first are actually requirements for cloud native. And headless is just, yeah, it's just an implementation of the API first, right? So the C is the most important part. So just wrapping up a bit, because we are almost out of time. In my opinion, Drupal can be used as a Mac platform, as one of the microservices in this Mac architecture with the necessary tweaks, but it would never meet the official Mac architecture uh, uh, standards, especially not from the Alliance, because it wasn't ever designed as a cloud native application. So it's evolving towards it or maybe it's evolving, we don't really know because who knows what the future is. But it's all because containers and Kubernetes have really taken off in the last couple of years and that the development speed has been really fast, but the development in, in the backends for, for, for systems which have to deal with all the history stuff, they don't evolve at the same space, uh, pace. So I think migrating Drupal into the cloud would be the first step into maturing, uh, but it wouldn't make Drupal cloud native immediately. And of course, this is just an hypothetical experiment and I didn't go very deep into some areas. We just don't have the time, uh, but this isn't, it's possible, but it's not always how it should be, right? I mean, we're not all Amazon or Netflix, so, you should always look at your specific business requirements to see if this kind of approach, uh, and specifically this is a software as a service uh, approach, is, uh, is viable for you. And also I would like to say that the monolith is not the enemy. Uh, so it's, it's definitely not the same as legacy. So it can be the, really the right approach for your project. And so somebody told me that I should always uh, end with a high note. So, well, I think uh, Drupal is open source and while it's not perfect, it is open source. And maybe we don't play with, according to all these rules set uh, by the new shiny toys, but still people in the community are already doing this in production, I think. So with that, I wanted to thank you and see if anybody has any questions. So I'm just looking through the chats to see if there are any questions. I see one from Yori. So a lot of SaaS CMS solutions do not offer, for example, a routing system or rendering system. In order for Drupal to move towards Mac, do you think important parts like these should be dropped altogether so it fit, fits better in, into the mock world. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, uh, I think, well, we, I think we had this discussion like, I don't know how long, how many years ago about small core and how core should be just the bare essentials. And I think this is the same discussion, right? So what is, what is Drupal and which direction Drupal wants to go? Um, I find it interesting how Drupal wants to be a competitor for WordPress sites and at the same time wants to be a competitor in the enterprise area 
but the enterprise or at least a part of the enterprise seems to be moving this way uh, in, in, into mock architectures. So you can, of course, still, oh, that's my timer. So of course you can still use Drupal uh, as a whole system in your mock architecture. Uh, and your whole mock arch architecture would still be mock. And, but yeah, it's an interesting question. Maybe Dries will uh, say something about it in, uh, in some upcoming uh, keynote. All right, thank you. I think the other closing keynote will start any minute now, so I'll be wrapping up.